Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is video part five. We've talked about the arteries and the veins, and now let's talk about the capillaries. Capillaries consist of just a single layer of endothelial cells lining the capillary. Most of these cells are joined together by tight, non-permeable junctions, and only tiny molecules like water and ions can pass through. Muscle, skin, fat, and nervous tissue all have these kinds of capillaries. There are other capillaries which have fenestrae or gaps in them, and that allows small molecules and some proteins to go across. You mostly see this in the intestinal villi and some endocrine organs and in the glomerulus. The spaces between cells are filled with something called interstitial fluid. This accounts for about a sixth of your total body fluid volume. And most of the fluid is trapped in a tissue gel. Only a tiny, tiny percent of it exists as free fluid. And this gel is made of these collagen fiber bundles and these proteoglycan filaments. Edema is when the amount of free fluid here greatly expands. Extra fluid or protein or other substances in this interstitial tissue space will drain into the lymphatic vessels. And these lymphatic vessels are another circulatory system throughout the body, which eventually drains into the thoracic duct on the left side and the right, the thoracic duct on, duct on the left side and the right lymph duct on the right side, and eventually all drains into the subclavian vein. And the total lymph flow in the body is about two to three liters per day. So now we have all the elements to understand a very important element called the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is the inner lining of the endothelial wall of capillaries. It's also called the brushy border. So here we see the inside of a capillary, here's its wall, and here's the glycocalyx lining on the inside. It's a web membrane of membrane-bound glycoproteins and proteoglycans that are on the border of the vascular endothelial cells. This is an important component of your total intervascular volume. About a liter, maybe more, of, of free water, of volume, is absorbed inside this brushy border. The purpose of the glycocalyx seems to be keeping plasma macromolecules like albumin in the center of the lumen and away from the endothelial surface. At the subglycocalyx, at the endothelial surface, right where this brushy border begins, your colloid oncotic pressure is really much lower than the plasma capillary oncotic pressure. In other words, since all the proteins are here, this is where the oncotic pressure is, and this is a relatively protein-free area of the vascular lumen. When patients are experiencing systemic inflammatory conditions like sepsis, for example, the glycocalyx will deteriorate. Here's a healthy glycocalyx on the left and a destroyed glycocalyx on the right. When this glycocalyx is destroyed, this is part of what leads to increased capillary leakage around those individual cells and interstitial edema, which people call third spacing, as fluid leaves the vasculature and goes into the interstitium. Here's another example of the same system showing individual endothelial cells lining the walls of the capillary, the lumen inside, the interstitium on the outside. We have hydrostatic pressures inside the vasculature. We call this capillary hydrostatic pressures. There is some hydrostatic pressure outside the capillaries. We would call this interstitial hydrostatic pressure. We also have oncotic pressures. Oncotic pressures due to proteins which can't cross the membrane and therefore pulling water towards them. We have capillary oncotic pressures. We have interstitial oncotic pressures. And now we've seen we also have what we can call an endothelial surface layer or a subglycocalyx oncotic pressure. It's inside the capillary, but it's really at the bottom of this glycocalyx where there aren't a lot of proteins. The reason this is important is because if you have learned about the Starling formula, you may have seen something like this, which shows 
a gradient of hydrostatic and onchotic pressures over time. And this formula is no longer considered to be accurate. So if you have textbooks or websites that you like to use that refer to this, you need to know that this is considered outdated. We're really focusing on the revised Starling formula. The, re the idea is that in the end, filtration, meaning is fluid going to move from the capillaries to the interstitium or not, is going to be proportional to this formula. The difference in hydrostatic pressure, the difference in oncotic pressure, but really not the difference between capillary and interstitial oncotic pressure, but the difference between capillary and subglycocalyx pressure. Let's analyze this just a little bit more slowly. Hydrostatic pressure forces fluid from the capillaries to the interstitial spaces because your hydrostatic capillary pressure is greater. Interstitial pressure is very low. In fact, it can even be negative. Where does all of this filtered fluid go? It goes into the lymphatic system. There really is very little reabsorption of interstitial fluid back into the vascular space. What about oncotic pressure? Again, we are not looking at the gradient between the interstitium and the capillaries because we have this glycocalyx. And most of the oncotic pressure differential is this transglycocalyx pressure. How much protein is in here versus how much protein is at the endothelial surface. In fact, there's quite a bit of protein in the interstitium. And so colloid oncotic pressure differential is really an intraendothelial force rather than a transendothelial force. This is important because we spoke before about the rationale of giving albumin or other colloids in order to create intravascular volume expansion. And the idea being if I put a lot of colloid in here like albumin, it will pull fluid from the interstitium. But we can see that really it's only going to pull fluid from the glycocalyx itself. And this will lead to further damage of the glycocalyx. What is this little sigma sitting over here? It's called the osmotic reflection coefficient. It basically describes how much albumin can, per can permeate this endothelial membrane. Zero would be fully permeable and one would be impermeable. So normally we expect this number to be close to one. Very little albumin can penetrate. And so albumin really stays in the intravascular space. But as the glycocalyx deteriorates, we expect this sigma value to go down. In total, net filtration pressure is slightly positive. In other words, fluid moves from the capillaries to the interstitium. So this leads us, I think, to the culmination of our discussion, which is the third space. You may have heard instructors or other people talk about third spacing or third space losses. The idea that protein-rich intravascular volume leaks out of the capillaries and accumulates in some compartments that aren't in rapid equilibrium with the extracellular fluid. So when a patient's under some kind of physiologic stress, whether it's trauma or ischemia or surgical tissue injury or burns or critical illness or sepsis, especially patients who have diabetes or hyperglycemia, all of these can cause third space losses. Even just IV fluids rapidly infusing could damage the glycocalyx just due to mechanical shear forces. What happens? Fluid leaves the vasculature and accumulates in soft tissues, skin, fat, muscle, bowel interstitium, peritoneal cavity, other traumatized tissues. And if patients have hypoalbuminemia, then they have even less plasma oncotic pressure and will lose fluid even more rapidly out of their vasculature. Over time, as the patient heals and the infection or the inflammation subsides, the third space fluid will start to return back to the vascular space. This is called mobilizing the third space fluid. It usually takes about 72 hours to start happening. <clears throat> so what do we do about our 
critically ill patients who are hypotensive, we're concerned that they don't have adequate intravascular volume, and we believe that third space losses are contributing to this problem. Overzealously treating with large volumes of IV fluids is not a good idea. Although IV fluid resuscitation may be important, it helps restore cardiac output and maintain blood pressure and prevent tissue ischemia and acute renal injury. Isotonic crystalloid may help rehydrate the glycocalyx, especially if hydrostatic capillary pressures are low. But over-resuscitation could lead to increased interstitial fluid accumulation and even abdominal compartment syndrome. So what do we do? Once again, goal-directed fluid therapy is the current recommended practice. Use evidence-based methods to assess intravascular volume status as well as tissue perfusion. And in almost all settings, there's no clear advantage to using colloids instead of crystalloids. And unless patients meet the specific criteria that we discussed in an earlier part of this section, there really is no indication to use colloids for most of these patients. The next topic we should discuss while we're in this area of circulation is edema. Edema just means excess fluid in tissues. You can have intracellular edema, like we saw with hyponatremia where free water moves into the cells. You could have a cell that decreases its metabolism or isn't delivering a lot of nutrition and it's not pumping out sodium. You can have inflammation, and basically the cell membrane becomes leaky and permeable, and sodium leaks into the cell. So you can have intracellular edema. You can also have extracellular cellular edema. Increased capillary pressure will cause fluid to leak into interstitial spaces. It could happen if you have high amounts of salt and water retention, like in renal failure. It can happen with high venous pressures, which we saw before in the person standing upright, or in heart failure, which we'll see later on, or venous obstruction. It could happen if you have decreased arterial resistance, so decreased sympathetic tone or vasodilator drugs or excessive body heat. All of these can cause extracellular edema. Decreased plasma proteins will cause extracellular edema due to decreased plasma oncotic pressure. This could happen because of protein loss, like in certain kidney diseases or burns or wounds. It could happen if you have decreased protein production, like in liver cirrhosis or malnutrition. And then other things can cause capillary leakage or permeability, like histamine release, toxins, infections, ischemia, and burns. Blockage of lymph return, as could happen in cancer, infection, or surgery, will also increase um, backflow into the interstitium, and you'll have more fluid accumulation in the interstitium. Edema to, due to heart failure specifically, which we discussed some in the cardiac section, occurs when there's decreased cardiac output leading to elevated venous pressure. And if patients have low arterial pressure, this will decrease kidney function, decrease salt and water excretion, and renin secretion will lead to angiotensin II and aldosterone and retention of more salt and water. And so back to our interstitium, which we said normally has an, almost a negative hydrostatic pressure, and all of the fluid is not free. It's really bound up in this um, gel form in this proteoglycan meshwork, and so there's almost like a suction in the interstitium that keeps it um, tight. But when hydrostatic pressure increases and free fluid starts to accumulate, now we get this spongy accumulation of free fluid, which we call pitting edema. And you can see they've pushed their thumb into this patient's tissue, and when they picked up the thumb, it leaves an indentation, like in a sponge, um, and that's due to free fluid causing edema. And pitting edema implies there's another type that you could have non-pitting edema, and that usually happens if the swelling occurs inside of cells, intracellular edema, or if your interstitium is clotted with fibrinogen, and that would also create like a gel type situation.
Finally, while we're talking about fluid going into various potential spaces, let's clarify these potential spaces. We have these surfaces that slide over each other with a very thin layer of fluid in between, and there are several examples. We have our pleural space. We have our pericardial space, our peritoneal cavity, uh, the spaces in our joints called synovial spaces. Normally these spaces are empty due to lymphatic drainage, but if fluid accumulates in these spaces, it's called an effusion. So you can have a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion or a synovial effusion. In the belly, it's not called a peritoneal infusion, it's called ascites. That's a good place for us to stop with this material. We will continue again in the next recording.